Hi everyone, my name is Paul. Welcome to Project Smart Home. Hope you're doing well. In this video, I'm going to share with you my experience over the last few years building and running my smart home. I've used technologies from Amazon, Google, SmartThings, and now I'm using Home Assistant. I'm going to share with you three important lessons I've learned along the way to help your smart home be successful. As I go through how my smart home has evolved, I'll give you my view on three things that you need to consider when building your smart home. The first one is design principles and planning. You want to aim for seamless automation. You shouldn't have to think about turning a light on when you go into a room. It should just happen. How do you want to access your smart home? Do you want to do it through voice controls? Do you want a mobile or a tablet device? If so, do you need voice in every room that you go into? Are you going to put your smart home apps on mobile devices for your family and kids to use? Do you need tablets on the wall so you can control things like security devices as and when you're leaving the house? With regard to planning, you want to think about the different rooms in your house and the types of automations you want in those rooms and then what smart devices you'd need to achieve those. So it may be from a lighting point of view that you want to have smart light bulbs or you may decide to go with smart switches. The decision's yours, but based on your automation principles. Once you've decided what automations you need and your smart devices, I would then focus on the highest priorities. What's going to give you the biggest rewards? For me, it was lighting because I was absolutely fed up with the kids leaving the lights on. Getting feedback from your family and people that you lived with is really important. And that leads me on to point number two. Build a smart home for you and your family to enjoy. Include your family or whoever you live with in the process. It'll make your smart home so much more successful. Run your ideas past them and get feedback on what you've set up and how it's working. They can even help you build a backlog of automations that will make their lives easier. So for example, the other day, my son came in and said to me, Dad, I'm struggling to get up in the morning. So we agreed on an automation that the lights would flash at 7.30 in the morning to help get him out of bed. Point number three is costs. There's potentially massive costs that could be involved in creating your smart home, obviously depending on what you want to achieve. It's only when I started to put the script together for this video that I realized how much I'd spent on my smart home over the last few years. I'm going to do a full cost breakdown of how much I've spent on my smart home in a separate video, but stick around until the end of this one because I'm going to show you how much I've spent in just one room and I was shocked, I'm sure you will be too. My smart home automation journey started in July 2017 when I brought my first Amazon Echo. I used it for obvious things like tell me the weather and asking general knowledge questions as well as playing some music and the kids used it for more educational reasons like tell me a joke or play some fart noises <laughs> honestly it was the kids that was asking for the fart noises so what inspired me to take things further in march 2018 i finally turned into my dad i found myself saying things like who's left the lights on why is the tv on when there's no one even in the room the printer's been left on for days when you start paying the bills, you can leave lights on all day. These sorts of things led me to start thinking about making my home smart. I started my smart home with lighting as that was the biggest issue with the kids leaving the lights on all the time. After a bit of research, I chose Philips Hue as my lighting platform. To get a fully working solution, you'll need a, a Hue hub. Think of this as the brains, also at least one bulb, but you also have to buy a motion sensor so you can automatically turn the lights on and off and depending on the size of your room you may need multiple motion sensors for example my living room is six meters by four meters i need a motion sensor each end of the room to get the coverage i need i chose philips hue as they had really good reviews they are expensive but i think they're worth the money it's a good quality product and they're still working today after many years of use during the year, I went on to buy Hue color light bulbs, standard bulbs and Hue motion sensors for pretty much every room in the house. I also added Philips Hue outdoor lighting as well, along with motion sensors. Hue also do a really nice night light, which I put in each of the kids' rooms. To be honest, we very rarely use the color light bulbs, except for the odd party and for those spooky Halloween lighting. You can just use the Hue platform standalone, but it's easy to add it to Amazon, which is a really nice feature. 
They have a nice integration with Philips Hue. So once you have your bulbs and motion sensors added to the Hue Hub, it's then easy to integrate the Amazon and Hue platforms to give you voice control over all of your lighting. One tip for you, which goes back to my lessons from earlier in the video, when adding your lights to Hue or any other platform, and before you add them to Amazon, make sure that you give your bulbs a name that's easy to remember and easy to say. So when you're asking Amazon to switch a particular light on or off, you don't end up getting frustrated because Amazon tells you that no, ex no device exists. I speak from experience here. I named a floor light in the lounge something like living room light floor lamp one, which led to a lot of frustration for my wife, as understandably she could never remember what it was called. Now in 2023, would I buy Hue? There are equally as good and cheaper options available today. You'll also need to consider your environment when planning what you need for your home. So for example, I have downlights in my kitchen and my bedroom that aren't smart. I've got two options. In the kitchen, I use a Shelly Smart Relay, and this is because the four-way light switch that they're on controls smart light bulbs as well as my kitchen lights. However, in the bedroom, I have smart switches from a company called Lightwave to control the downlights. I'll be covering more details on how I use these in a later video. So you might now feel happy that you have a light or two that turns on and off as you enter a room. But what activates the lights is motion. So imagine this, you sat sitting still, watching TV, reading a book, the lights will switch off because there's no motion and you'll be thrust into darkness. At which point you'll need to start a Mexican wave with your family just to get the lights to come on again. There is a solution to this problem I use a product from Acara called the Acara Presence FP2. These are amazing devices. Not only do they detect motion, they also detect presence. So back to the same scenario, sat sitting very still, watching TV or reading a book. The Acara FP2 will detect you. It detects the slightest movement, even your chest going up and down as you breathe. I've now started to replace my motion sensors with these amazing devices. I'd recommend looking at these as you plan your smart home. I'm gonna cover these in a later video in more detail. So by this point of my smart home automation journey, I've got a pretty good setup. I've got my Hue lights in every room in the house. The lights switch on and off when people enter and exit the room. I can control the lights using my Amazon app or my voice on the Amazon hubs that I've got dotted around the house. So the first objective of automating my lights is achieved, but I now need more. During 2019, I started to expand my smart home beyond automated lighting. As my smart home evolved, I started to include things like Nest security cameras and a Nest video doorbell. So I wanted to include smart hubs with a display as part of my smart home. Because I'd bought Nest products that Google now own, and the fact that I use the Google platform for photos, and I also have an Android phone, I concluded that switching to the Google platform would be the right thing to do. I now have a Google Nest Display Hub in pretty much every room in the house. They're great electronic picture frames, and we've got a constant view of photos of our friends and family scrolling around on them. The kids use them to listen to music on, and it's great for us for announcing when it's dinner time. As I mentioned previously, I've got the Nest video doorbell. As soon as this rings, I get an audible notification announcing who is at the front door, assuming that the database recognizes their faces, as well as the video feed from the doorbell being streamed to each Google display around the house. I can then decide whether to answer the door or not. I also get a notification on my phone. So if I am away from the house, I can talk to the person who's at the door, which is great for those important parcel deliveries for your next smart home project. With regard to moving my smart home devices from Amazon to Google, to be honest, that was pretty easy because you can have things like the Hue Hub integrated with both Amazon and Google. So for a short period of time, I had both voice platforms available to me. Then once I'd set up my automations in Google, I could start to remove the Amazon Hubs. 
As my automation ideas for smart homes started to evolve, I realized some limitations. I wanted to start using different branded products to automate different things. So for example, it's a weekday, I'm getting up for work, I walk into my kitchen, I want the hue lights to switch on. That's fine. I can do that with a single hue integration. But if I also want to use the same hue motion sensor that just switched on my hue lights to also switch on my LiFix LED strip lights, that's just not possible. Or for more complex automations using the same hue motion sensor to switch the lights on, play radio in the kitchen display on a work day, but only first thing in the morning, that just isn't possible. Unfortunately, when I was trying to do this a couple of years ago, Google Home was just not aware of hue motion sensors. So it couldn't be used for these more complex cross-platform automations. I believe it's the same today, which is a real pain. Well, what do you do to fix this? I hear you ask. The problem with just using Amazon or Google is the limited product integrations and interoperability across these platforms. So, for the next phase of my project Smart Home, I needed to find a solution that allowed me to be able to better leverage cross-platform automations. SmartThings opened up a whole new world of smart home automation opportunities for me. As well as fixing my problem with cross-platform automations with my lighting, I was able to make my fridge, freezer, washing machine and dishwasher all smart. Hello, this is the fridge speaking. My milk is getting warm. Please, can you close the fridge door? To get the cross-platform automations working in SmartThings, I had to buy a SmartThings hub. I needed to add my existing smart devices, such as my Philips Hue hub, to the SmartThings hub and remove the Hue integrations from Google. Once all the smart devices were added to SmartThings, I could start to leverage its automation capabilities to build my cross-integrated automations. Once I had SmartThings fully up and running and controlling my existing smart home, I then went on to think about things on how I could improve my smart home. I bought some SmartThings smart plugs with Energy Monitor so I could write an automation to tell me when the appliances like the washing machine, tumble dryer and dishwasher had finished running. Hello, this is the washing machine speaking. Your washing cycle has now finished. The automation monitored the power usage of the appliance and notified me when the power usage had returned to zero watts for at least five minutes. I also bought SmartThings door contacts for the fridge and freezer so that I could have a voice and text notification when the fridge or freezer door was left open for more than two minutes. Although SmartThings did move my smart home forward, to be honest, I found SmartThings really to be quite clunky. If you were integrating the SmartThings smart plugs or SmartThings door contact sensors, they integrated like a dream and worked really well. However, third-party integrations weren't that straightforward. Things like the Philips Hue integration didn't work the first time, and some light bulbs didn't, didn't appear, they just didn't seem to get imported into SmartThings. The range of available integrations wasn't that extensive either. You quite often had to find and try something from the community, a community project from GitHub, and try and integrate that into SmartThings using their IDE platform which again was problematic and definitely not for somebody that just wanted things to work out the box like I did. In addition to sometimes difficult third-party integrations, I found that I had to do some coding to get the automations working that I wanted. I used a tool called WebCore, which integrated with SmartThings. There's quite a lot of good information about this. So I found using example code as a starting point and then adopting it for my own automations worked quite well. But again, not exactly the out-of-box experience that most people want, unless you've got some coding background. As I added more products to my smart home, I found that I needed to look for an easier to use solution with better, easier integrations as smart things just wasn't meeting my needs. As my smart home continued to evolve and I added things like smart thermostatic radiator valves, smart door locks, robot vacuum cleaners, smart light relays, Wi-Fi integration into a smart network, solar panel infrastructure. I needed a new 
smart home automation platform that had a much wider range of supported integrations. Enter Home Assistant. I started to use Home Assistant in January 2022 after getting a much sought after Raspberry Pi as a Christmas present. It's been relatively easy to get going, but before you get started, you need to consider where you're going to run your Home Assistant. I decided to use Raspberry Pi, but other hardware and software options are available. You can find an up-to-date list of where you can run Home Assistant on the Home Assistant website. There's also a great community of YouTubers explaining how to get things up and running on Home Assistant. The Home Assistant platform itself gets updated with new features and new integrations every month. It has a huge range of integrations that work out of the box, as well as a very solid Home Assistant community, more commonly known as Hacks, where you can find more integrations that aren't part of the standard Home Assistant repository. I'm currently using 35 integrations to get my smart home running. Home Assistant fully integrates with Amazon and Google, so I can still control my smart devices using my voice via the Home Assistant integration. To get remote access and to get the voice access working with Home Assistant, I've taken out a subscription with Nabu Casa. This isn't mandatory. You can still get remote access set up without having to pay for this subscription, but it's by far the easiest option. As well as providing a much wider range of integrations, moving my smart home devices to Home Assistant has allowed me to reduce the number of smart hubs I need. I'm using Home Assistant add-on called Zigbee to MQTT, which allows Home Assistant to have its own Zigbee network. I need to add Zig a Zigbee dongle to my Raspberry Pi and configure it in Home Assistant to get this working. I'm using a Sonoff Zigbee dongle to do this. Again, there's lots of videos on how to do this on YouTube, and there are other supported Zigbee dongles that are listed on the Home Assistant website. Adding the Zigbee dongle allowed me to add all of my Hue and SmartThings devices directly to Home Assistant. This was quite time consuming as I had to remove each device from the old hub and then add the device and configure its associated automations in Home Assistant. I was able to run my Hue hub and my SmartThings hub at the same time as doing the migration, so my smart home impact was minimal. The biggest impact was me trying to get the Home Assistant automations correct for the new devices. Once this was complete, I could remove the Hue and SmartThings hub. You don't have to do this. You can just integrate the hubs into Home Assistant, but I wanted to simplify my smart home by removing them. I have also subsequently added a car emotion and presence sensors directly to Home Assistant, which means I don't need a hub for the Acara system either. All of my smart home devices use Zigbee with the exception of my front door, which is a Z-Wave device. I'm using Home Assistant Z-Wave JS add-on to configure and control my smart locks, along with a Z-Wave dongle attached to my Raspberry Pi. I'm using the AOTech stick, but there are other options that are supported, which are documented on the Home Assistant website. When I'm looking for new home automation products, I now always check to make sure that there's a supported integration in Home Assistant, as I know this will help me more easily integrate the solution into my home. I've not yet found any smart home device that I've wanted to use that's not supported. For example, I have also been able to integrate my solar install so I can get stats from my solar edge inverter on production and export of electricity, as well as stats from my energy eddy to see how my solar is heating my hot water. In my future videos, I'm going to be showing you a lot more about how I use Home Assistant for my project smart home. So if there's anything that I've mentioned today that you would like to hear more about, please let me know in the comments below. Home Assistant isn't perfect. From a voice point of view, I'm still having to use both Amazon and Google to meet my smart home requirements. Let me explain. 
I love the fact that I've very easily been able to integrate Google Home with Home Assistant so that I can, when needed, control all of my smart home devices using my voice. This is great for 99% of what I need. But recently I've been setting up room presence using a brilliant device called an ESP32 and using software called ES Presence, which integrates with Home Assistant. The idea is that you can have an ESP32 in each room. This device then uses Bluetooth to detect your room presence. As an example, when I walk into the kitchen in the morning, assuming I have my mobile phone with me, I will be detected and Home Assistant will trigger an automation telling me the weather forecast for the day and asking me if I'd like to listen to the radio. Hello, Paul. Would you like to listen to radio too? Yes. Okay. This is great. I really love this feature, but the problem is that I've had to dig out my Amazon devices because I haven't been able to find a way to set up the question and answer response with Google. This means that in rooms that I want to use ES Presence with the ESP32s, I'm having to use an Amazon Hub as well as Google Hub for my normal voice activities. It isn't the end of the world, it's just a bit of a pain. I've run you through Home Assistant very quickly as I wanted to give you an overview and a taster of what I have set up and hopefully get you started with your smart home. I'll be doing more videos on this subject and going into much more detail. Let me know in the comments below if I have left you with any unanswered questions and I'll do my best to answer them for you. I mentioned earlier in the video about the costs or the potential costs of setting up a smart home. Home automation is a very expensive hobby and I dread to think how much I've spent over the years. In my future videos, I'm going to go into more detail about what smart home devices I have around my house and what automations I'm using to control them. I'm going to talk you through how much I've spent in just one room. When planning your smart home, consider what your priorities are or the biggest wins. For me, it was lighting. You should focus on your biggest wins first. Okay, so using my kitchen as an example, I have the following. I've got three hue element lights. These are lovely pendant lights that I've got hanging over my breakfast bar. And these were £59.97 for the three of them. I've got four smart things smart plugs and these were £119.96 for the four of them. I use these for some lighting and for my appliances so I can monitor energy use and they can tell me when they finish their washing cycle, for example. I've got two Lifex LED strip lights with extension kits. There's about six to eight meters in total. And that were, I've got two of those and that was £195.98 for both of them. They're terrible. I wouldn't buy them. I've never been able to get them to connect to the Wi-Fi network. I have to use smart plugs to control them. Next thing is I've got one Shelly smart relay switch and that was £10.83. And I use that to control my down lights that aren't smart in the kitchen. I'll come to back to that later. I've got one Acara FP2 presence sensor. I touched upon this earlier in the video. These are amazing. I've got these controlling three different lighting zones in my kitchen, and these were £82.99 just, just for the one, so it's quite expensive, but it does an awful lot. And again, I'm going to cover these later in a different video. I've got one ESP32, which is used for my presence detection. So you may remember earlier when I come into the kitchen in the morning, it knows that I'm there and it'll start playing the radio and lights will come on and those sorts of things. My vacuum cleaner is in the kitchen, my smart vacuum cleaner, and that's a, a Roomba i7. And that was £470.20 for the vacuum cleaner and £295.99 for the base. So that was quite expensive. I've included the vacuum cleaner in the kitchen, but you could take that out of these costs. I've got one Google Nest Smart Hub at £219. I've got uh, one Amazon Dot at £29.99. So you may remember earlier, I'm using the Dot for the action response notifications for my automations. I've got one Tado thermostatic radio valve, which was £64.99. They come in a pack of two, but that's just the cost for one of those. And I use that to regulate the heating on the radiator in the kitchen. 
I've also got one Tado thermostat, which was £79.95. I've got two Acara door sensors at £28.99 for the two. I know you have those on both of my external doors in the kitchen. And finally, I've got two Smart Things door sensors, which I use on the fridge and freezer to tell me when um, somebody's left the fridge open and it notifies me audibly and a uh, push notification to my phone. So this is a total cost just for the kitchen of £1,714.06. If you want that in US dollars at the time of making this video, that would be a total cost of $2,190.13. And that's just for the kitchen. Ouch. I'm sure there are cheaper products out there that could help reduce your costs. But the point I'm trying to make is that creating a smart home can get very expensive. I'd love to hear from you what products you're using and whether you'd recommend them or not. So in summary, there are three things that you should consider when building your project smart home. Point number one, before you buy anything, plan and think about what you're trying to achieve with your project smart home. Think about your smart home principles. You want to aim for seamless automation. So when you walk into a room, things just happen without thinking about it. The lights come on automatically when you enter the room. When you leave the room, the lights turn off automatically. Same with TVs and printers and those sorts of things. Consider who else uses the house. Think about your family and friends in everything that you do. Consider accessibility. So no matter how smart your home is, you probably still need to control it with voice or mobile apps or tablets. Make sure you can get user feedback. Speak to people in the house. They'll be a great source to generate new ideas, how to improve things and really work on promoting feedback from them. Choose a smart home platform that's right for you based on the outcomes that you want to achieve from your smart home. You may want to evolve it over time like I did. There's nothing wrong with that and it's a great way to get into smart home technology to see if it's right for you and you can also spread the costs over a longer period of time. Alternatively, of course, you can jump straight in with Home Assistant. There's a great community of people on YouTube that use Home Assistant already and there's lots of content out there that can help you get started. Once you have your design principles written down, you can start to plan what smart home features you want in your house. Document what you want in each room. You'll need to consider lighting. For example, smart bulbs versus smart switches versus smart relays. This will depend on what you want to achieve. You may find that you have to go with a particular option as you don't want to replace your down lights that aren't smart, or you have a certain style of light switch or socket that you don't want to replace which may mean you have to choose something like the Shelly Smart Relay to control your lights. When planning, consider who else is in the house and involve them. The second thing to think about when planning your smart home is who else is using it. I learned this lesson the hard way. For the first couple of years, I worked on my smart home in isolation. This inevitably caused problems. People in the house didn't understand not to switch light switches off because it would stop automations from working. They also won't know how to switch specific lights on using their voice if they don't know what you've called them. Imagine you have a motion sensor in the guest room slash office that you've cleverly automated to come on when motion is detected. That's great until you have a guest stay over and the automation triggers the lights as they are moving around in bed in the middle of the night. You can avoid many of these issues by communicating and explaining to your family what new automations you've introduced and that you would love their feedback on how things can be improved. I'm at the stage now where I have requests for new automations and improvements that I never would have thought of by myself. The third point to consider is cost. Cost is a big factor that I touched upon in this video, but I do plan to do a full cost breakdown in a future video. My smart home is my hobby. At least that's how I've justified spending as much as I have on it. It's also fair to say it's become a little bit addictive. You finish one automation or smart project and immediately thinking about what to automate next. Costs may well impact your planning stage. As I've mentioned already, the cost for building a smart home can soon add up. Think about what is going to create the biggest impact with your smart home and start with that. Your smart home can and will evolve over time. This brings me to the end of this video. Everything covered here is based on my own experience and I've not been sponsored in any way to create this video content. 
This is one in a series of videos that I plan to make about how I've built my project smart home. Hopefully you found this video useful. Thank you for watching. Please let me know in the comments if you have any questions or if you would like any more detail on what I've shown in this video.